welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are Bithermia Acquisitions Inc. We have an innovative, new, disruptive technology and therapy to show. We will show you today how to how we address the end stage cancer patient. Um, our contact information is on the bottom here. You have our email for any questions at info at fithermia.com. And you can view our website at www.fithermia.net. Next. Today presenting to you will be our uh, part of our team, myself as Chief Executive Officer, Roger Vertries, um, Chief Science Officer, Joseph Swischenberger, Chief Medical Officer, Jan Winnitz, our Chief Clinical Officer, and our CFO, David Wilder. This team presents many years of experience in the uh, oncological medical space in the treatment using hypothermia. Next. The thermia has been in existence via the research of Roger Vertries for 30 plus years. The Thermia, the company, was founded in 2012 to advance hypothermia treatments. This team has a depth of experience and knowledge in the hypothermia space and has created a new innovative therapy and technology in order to extend the life of end-stage cancer patients. We will be using that therapy and technology to produce a revenue producing and profitable company using both the right to try method and the FDA and FDA clearance. Next. There are lethal cancers in 2019 of over 600,000. Lung cancer is the leading cause of death of men and women in the United States. Um, ovarian cancer also has a very high mortality rate. In our phase one studies, we treated both lung cancer and ovarian cancer patients. This shows you that there are there is a significant patient pool for us to treat. Um, as you can see, we will have a very large number of people requiring our treatments. Next. The road to clearance with the FDA is through our phase one studies. We did a phase one lung cancer trial that was successful and a stage one ovarian cancer trial, which was successful. The company plans on going back to the FDA shortly for clearance. Um, and upon clearance, the company would be able to begin treatments, we predict within 60 to 90 days of clearance. Next. We also can avail ourselves now of the, with respect to the right to try law, which was passed in 2018. That allows eligible patients to use investigative drugs and therapies of which we are one. Um, and there are various requirements for that and we meet those requirements. Next. I'd now like to introduce Roger Vertries, who has been working in this field for over 30 years um, and has pioneered this technology along with Dr. Swischenberger. I will hand this now off to Roger. Thank you, uh, folks, and thank you for meeting us. Um, during this very difficult time and in your interest in our company. The story that you're about to hear has been continuously, next slide please, continuously vetted by medical science in peer-reviewed articles since 1991. In 2007, Dr. Swischenberger became the chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Kentucky, thus ending our active collaboration. Recently, we reunited with a commitment to bring this technology to fruition. What we're going to tell you about today is a story about a technology that will result in a paradigm shift in the treatment of cancer, 
because we have shown that hyperthermia induces death to cancer at local metastasizing and remote slides. Next slide, please. Showing the results of an experiment here that was done in 1991, and which really the, uh, the outflow of this experiment was the next 30 years of work. The results demonstrate that cancer cells um, are susceptible to heat as the numbers decrease after heat therapy, as shown by the red line. The green line shows the number of surviving cells from non-cancer cell lines. And you can see there is less than a 5% reduction in those, uh, in those cells. Next slide, please. Once we determined that cancer cells were indeed heat sensitive, it took us the next six or seven years and over 100 swine experiments to learn how to do this safely in humans. These references are important milestones and showed that by using a modified heart-lung machine, it was possible to heat the body evenly throughout. That, by including dialysis, we were able to normalize serum chemistries. That, by this technique, we were able to, to deliver a consistent amount of heat, which we call a thermal dose. And the culmination of all this effort is that we were able to show that heat kills cancer cells. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We have shown that heat can be delivered safely by our technology. Destroys cells and tumors, destroys metastasizing cancer cells, resulted in an increase in survival in our F1 uh, in our FDA phase one patients with stage four terminal cancers resulted in an improvement in the quality of life in these patients and show that heat may effective, effectively uh, increase the uh, efficacy of other kinds of treatments. Next slide, please. Basically, we designed a system to safely heat the body from the inside with our proprietary process called heat. We take the uh, target temp tissue up to 107.6 degrees Fahrenheit and maintain it there for two, two hours. Next slide, please. It takes about five hours to do this procedure in the operating room with our heat machine. Basically, it heats the body to the, uh, and the target tissues or uh, temp uh, tumors to 42 degrees centigrade. We detoxify the blood we restore the normal, normal blood chemistries and then return the blood back to the patient in a continuous manner. Next slide, please. This is a picture of an actual setup in the operating room where we're about to, uh, to do this um, patient with uh, ovarian cancer. Uh, the, this device is uniquely developed around a modified heart-lung pump, uh, dialysis cartridge, a detoxification chamber, and the heat transfer equipment. All aspects of this procedure are carefully monitored and displayed in real time on the monitor that you can see on the left. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The next presenter is Dr. Swiftenberger who is a former chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Kentucky. He is a professor of surgery and pediatrics and one of the main developers of ECMO technology. Dr. Swischenberger holds many patents, is a very successful NIH researcher, and has held many positions as a grant uh, receiver and consulting medical scientist uh, with the uh, NIH. A real quick story, I moved to the University of Texas in Galveston in 1991 as a perfusionist. Uh, Dr. Swischenberger had arrived there just previous to that as a newly minted cardiothoracic surgeon. 
Well, I, in my first year there, I was accepted into the graduate school, uh, school in pathology. And one day after a heart case, Dr. Swischenberger and I were sitting in the library discussing research and basically realized that we're both middle-aged guys and that we only had one chance to make a mark as far as clin medical, clinical medicine goes. So we decided to pick the most devastating disease we could find with the least amount of therapeutic options. So we chose patients with terminal cancers. And it just so happens that Dr. Swischenberger was one of the local recognized experts in lung cancer. So our first study uh, focused on uh, patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, so it's my great pleasure. I want to introduce a very close friend um, and back collaborating together, uh, Dr. Swischenberger. Thanks, Roger. Well, as you can see, I'm much younger than Roger, but we'll, we'll let that go for now. Next slide. Hypothermia has been studied in several phase one trials. As you can see, it's, it started way back in the past before any treatment had been developed for HIV and AIDS. And we found that hyperthermia did have a profound effect on the virus. However, because effective drug therapy came into being at that time, we switched our focus to metastatic cancer, which to this day doesn't have effective treatment. The first one was a stage four lung cancer, where we were able to do a phase one study on 10 patients with a target temperature of 42 degrees centigrade. We saw a prolonged survival to a meeting of 450 days. The second was a stage four lung cancer, which is currently in progress, where we did four patients where we were able to uh, achieve a 42 degree centigrade dose with no adverse events. But it was stopped for immunotherapy trials, which we're going to resume soon. Stage four ovarian cancer trial, which Roger alluded to, was very successful at 42 degrees centigrade, with a survival prolonged to a median of 633 days. Both all of these trials showed prolonged survival but were not prospective randomized studies. Next. The science behind this has been alluded to, but I think a visual is really important because there's a difference between the tolerance of cancer cells, which do not have the metabolic processes or the heat shock proteins to protect them against heat. It's a complex adaptive mechanism that normal cells have evolved to all have, but cancer cells lose that ability. So there's a therapeutic window between 41 and 43 degrees centigrade represented in the middle of this slide that is the target of how you can kill cancer cells and yet not injure normal cells. Next slide. So in our FDA, no, you went back. Go forward. Okay. So to induce systemic hyperthermia is a new concept, and I'm going to explain it to you. You take an extracorporeal circuit, which is a heart-lung machine, and warm the blood to a target temperature of 42 degrees centigrade, precisely controlled. We then perfuse the blood by taking it out of the body from the venous system, heating the blood, and then returning it to the venous system very close to the right heart. The right heart pumps blood to the lungs. Now, the lungs are thought of for gas exchange, but actually they have the surface area the size of a tennis court. And this serves as a radiator to evenly distribute the heat. And a car, your radiator takes off heat. In this circumstance, the lung distributes the heat. The left heart then perfuses the whole body, including traditionally insulated areas, such as the bone marrow, brain, and mediastinum, places where metastatic cancer usually hides from therapeutic trials and treatments. Next. This Kaplan-Meier curve from Galveston, from our phase one initial study, shows that when we did match controls, we sh had significantly prolonged survival using the veno venous system that we developed at that time. It's subsequently been refined to the heat technology. Next slide. Jan, why don't you uh, take it away? And uh, Mitch, why don't you introduce him? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Jan Winnitz. I have been a practicing physician for over 35 years, specializing in internal medicine and nephrology. 
I have been intimately involved in an ovarian cancer trial uh, run by Verthermia with remarkable results. Next slide, please. These patients were 10 patients that were terminally ill. Many of them were under hospice care. These were patients who had failed all treatments, including chemotherapy with multiple lines, radiation therapy, surgery, and they came to us as a last resort. Next slide, please. This slide demonstrates the remarkable effects of this phase one study. The expected survival of these 10 patients was 7.8 months. And in fact, the mean survival was 19.7 months. Now, two of these patients had complications from the surgical procedure, not this procedure that was used to treat their cancers, but the treatment from the surgery itself. If we remove the results from those patients, the mean, the mean average of survival is now up to 24 months. What is also noted that these patients expired, or 80% of them expired from the chemotherapy that the protocol mandated that the patients return to. These were the same agents that failed in the beginning, and they have caused them their demise. Now, imagine if we were able to continue to treat the patients with our therapy, how much longer they may have survived. That remains to be determined in future studies. The next slide, please. All of these patients responded differently. Now, I'm showing you one patient in particular who was a terminal patient with end-stage disease. If you notice the slide on your left, those hot spots circled by the blue are primary lesions, and the other spots were metastatic lesions. Now, if you look on the slide on the right, after our treatment, there is no evidence of any tumors. There is no metastatic lesions and there's no primary ovarian tumors. Next slide, please. This slide shows a, a couple of things. Number one, the patients respond differently. Some patients may respond to fewer treatments than others. But if we look at the time of the expected treatment, a little over 200 days, and then you look at our patients that had a survival of 600 days. And if we remove those two patients that died from the complications of the surgery, it gets to over 700 days. Now, what is remarkable about this treatment, it is not just the longevity. It is also the quality of life that was returned to these patients. Next slide, please. Oh, go back to the previous slide. These were patients that were terminally ill. And they came to us with a, a restoration after our treatment of their quality of life to where before they became ill. We had one patient that two weeks after her procedure went canoeing. We had another patient that climbed half dome. And another patient had a wish to visit Europe, and which she did. She spent two and a half times in Europe, two and a half months in Europe. And these are just a few examples of these heartwarming stories that we have from these patients. In all my years of practicing medicine, I have never come across a more effective treatment, in not just the longevity, but in the quality of life as well. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce to you again, our CEO, Mitchell May. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And um, as you can see, in addition to Jan's um, incredible knowledge and expertise and degrees, he, he also has an incredibly kind heart and takes to heart the ability to actually extend the life and quality of life 
of these patients. Um, next slide, please. As you can see here, um, these studies were started in the early 90s. Uh, to date, over $42 million has been sent, spent on this research to bring us to the point where we believe we can safely and effectively treat cancer patients extending their life. Um, this research was done both in, in conjunction with Dr. Vertries and Dr. Swissenberger, both together and separately, and now the team is back together again. I think you have a powerful, strong team going forward that's going to deploy this therapy and technology to extend people's lives. Next slide, please. Um, you know, here's our team. You have Dr. Vertries, Dr. Winnitz, who you've heard from. Um, Jay Smith is our secretary. You have Gary Keeling, who early on in this with his brother also did extensive research into this uh, field and contributed greatly. Our management team is myself, uh, Dr. Swischenberger, and uh, our CFO, David Wilder. And you can see bios at uh, vithermia.net um, or .com. Um, next slide, please. In addition, we have a significant medical advisory board. You have Dr. Bartlett at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Chi at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. Cusack at Harvard, um, Dr. DiBernardo at Cleveland Clinic, and Dr. LeBeau at Mount Sinai. And what's significant here is that this is not just names on a piece of paper. We meet with these um, advisors monthly. They've insisted on being kept in the loop and having an active participatory role in the direction of this company. Next slide, please. Um, we have a very strong group of advisors, um, Connexum, which consists of former senior level FDA uh, officers to help us through the FDA process, Delta Med uh, with respect to biostats in order to present that data correctly, uh, our securities and business lawyer, Craig Butler. Next slide, please. Um, our intellectual property uh, attorney, uh, because there is a lot of intellectual property that we're protecting here in addition. Um, we have already retained uh, auditors, so we have uh, audited financial statements um, in preparation for going public. And our significant partner, Cova Capital, uh, partners who helps us with respect to our uh, financing and bringing this company uh, to actively being able to deploy our therapy and technology to save people's lives. Next slide, please. I'm now going to uh, pass you on to our CFO, David Wilder, who will bring you through the financial modeling for this company. Thank you, David. All right, so David, if you can go to the next slide, I can. David, I can... you're unmuted. David? Yes, sorry. Oh, no worries, go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for um, your time this afternoon. I'll be covering a summary of projected cash flows, use of proceeds, our offering, and our pre and post money valuations. What I'm presenting to you right now is an eight month cash flow projection. While the company has more robust five-year projections, it is critical to note that the projected cash flows from operations turned positive as early as September of this year. This is a summary of a more a detailed cash flow analysis. The core assumptions of our cash flow projection include inflows from a $5 million minimum raise by mid-May. Uh, this cash flow from the raise is net of investment banking fees of 6.5%. We also assume cash flows from patient treatments, which are reflected at gross margin. That is $265,000 of revenue per patient, less surgical center charges of $80,000 per patient, for a gross margin of $185,000 per patient. If you look at the bottom of our slide, we list the number of procedures. The number of procedures start in September at one per week. This gradually increases to five procedures per week in December. 
There are also pro bono patients starting in October with one procedure per month whose costs will be absorbed by the company. In terms of capacity and volume, these are modest assumptions. Under cash outflows, CapEx includes up to seven heat delivery systems at approximately 450,000 per new unit. Two of these heat delivery systems are refurbishable for approximately 170,000 and are available for rapid deployment to begin treatments in August. CapEx also includes three test equipment packages at approximately $81,000 per package. It is important to note that most of the new heat delivery systems and test equipment packages are dedicated to clinical trials and year two installations. Hence, we're making heavy investments in year one for year two growth. We've also included 640,000 as an investment in future development of the heat delivery system. The FDA projected cash outflows include multiple FDA uh, report submissions with substantial support from our FDA consultants. We have included regulatory and medical support, monthly ongoing pig testing starting in June at 20,000 per month, and monthly clinical testing starting in August at 300,000 per month. Regarding professional fees, a substantial portion of the fees are driven by the company's intent to complete a reverse merger with the Public Shale Corporation in 2020. Accordingly, there are substantial associated legal and audit work requirements. As a result of the very reverse merger, the company hopes to have its S1 made effective by September, or, excuse me, in, by the SEC in January 2021. The projected out cash outflows for other operations include training and salaries, which reflect a heavy investment in staffing for year two. The staffing includes high-level surgical trainers, clinical support staff for, this, for the year two installations. There are also substantial investments in sales and marketing to position the company for a year two accelerated growth plan. Lastly, there are other supporting expenses including insurance, IT, travel, and corporate compliance, such as board of directors and medical advisory board meetings. In summary, the company's projected net cash outflows turned positive by September. We define net operating cash flows as taking all net cash flows and add back the capex and the taxes. Use of proceeds. As we mentioned in the pro uh, projected cash flows, we, invested, we will invest 3.2 million in seven heat delivery systems, five delivery systems, um, and three test equipment packages, and future development of heat systems. Again, most of these use of proceeds are for clinical trials and year two installations. The company will invest 2.2 million to support all its co the company's FDA and regulatory support. Lastly, as discussed in the projected cash flows, there are significant investments in staffing to support the companies uh, through year two. Regarding the offering, the minimum offering is $5 million, with a maximum offering of $20 million, all at 50 cents a share. These offering shares are in advance of a planned PUBCO reverse merger. Because these shares are in advance, we are offering a 5% premium meaning purchase 1 million shares and you would get 1 million 50,000 shares. This is the same premium that was given previously to a group of investors in March of 2020. Regarding the reverse merger, we project the S1 uh, filing to become effective in January of 2021. Accordingly, your shares could be freely traded thereafter. Valuation, the free money valuation is estimated to be approximately $47 million. The post-money valuation is estimated to be as high as $654 million based on equivalent NASDAQ small cap cancer treaty relating companies. Their average share price is approximately $6 per share. As reference, we've included large uh, NASDAQ cap companies in the cancer treatment arena. If you include them, the average price could be as high as $31 per share. Our post money valuation is based on FDA clearance and right to try, scaling additional locations, and uplisting to NASDAQ in the future. Also, management believes that the current COVID pandemic will not materially affect our valuations. Mitch?
Thank you, David. Um, I would just like to take a moment and thank you for listening to our presentation. We appreciate it. We think we have an innovative, disruptive technology that will uh, significantly affect end-stage cancer patients. And if you have any questions with respect to that, um, that you think of after, um, please feel free to email us at info at thethermia.com. And if you have any questions regarding our offering or investment, please feel free to reach out to our investment bankers, Covert Capital Partners. Um, and you have uh, Edward Gibstein's email on the bottom, and you have uh, also his phone number. Uh, I'm happy to entertain any questions that we have at this time um, regarding the presentation. Hi, Mitch, it's Arthur. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming on and sharing your day with us and uh, being attentive here. We haven't lost anybody from the beginning, uh, so I'm grateful for that. And uh, again, thank you for all your support uh, through this hard time. And, and uh, I have a question that others may be thinking about, Mitch, if that's okay? Of course. So um, I'm not so familiar with the clinical terms, but th this is for end-stage cancer patients, which is uh, meaning that their uh, expiry is imminent in some short period of time, I guess. But before you correct me on that, I think what would be interesting for the group to understand is what's the alternative to using in place of heat great that's a great that's a great question so so with respect to seven of our end stage ovarian cancer patients there was no other alternative they were coming off of hospice so they had already determined that they were going to make themselves comfortable at the end of their lives and um expire so there was no alternative treatment there um we're treating end-stage patients that have failed other lines of therapy. So there isn't a viable um, option that extends life to the extent that we do um, when you're actually at that hospice stage, when you're at the stage where you're going to, you know, be comfortable and, and, and pass. Um, so that's a, that's a large portion of our treatable population. Um, and then when you come to the when you come a step back from that, that would be patients that have the option of um, continuing to try other clinical trials or radical testing or, you know, significant uh, chemo and radiation treatments that, you know, as Dr. Winnitz alluded to, sometimes the, uh, you know, the, the, the cure is worse than the disease. Um, so with respect to our population base, they, we are an end stage treatment. We are we are presenting to people who don't have viable alternatives um, when we take them out of hospice. So, to use an overused term, uh, what's the size of the cohort in terms of patients in the total dressable market for you? We have no idea. So, is it you know four hundred thousand people? Is it fifty thousand people? Yeah, great, great question. So you have 600,000 plus people dying just in the United States in 2019 of cancer. So, you know, that would be an addressable pool. Um, just to be practical, those people would have to want that treatment and have the ability to afford that treatment. Um, but if you, if you just go based upon that 600,000, that would be our addressable cohort. And of those, it would be whittled by those who would choose to use our treatment, um, you know, and who could afford our treatment. But 600,000 is certainly a, a, a very fair number. And that number is just in the United States. That doesn't take into account uh, people who would come in for this treatment from outside of the country. So, uh, again, I'm just an investor, so I'm asking investor questions, if that's okay. Sure. And so in the first 24 months, what percentage of that cohort would you need to penetrate to have a real business? Sure, so, so let's, just do some, let's just do some quick math. You know, so if you have 600,000 people who could 
conceivably be at end stage and hospice at any point and have the viability of using this treatment. Um, and if you just take 1% uh, of those, because I use the standard 1% of the wealth being, you know, 1% 1, 1 of the population controlling most of the wealth. So that should put the ability for them to afford the treatment in their hands. You now have a population of 6,000 people. Um, you know, if even half of those people chose to avail themselves of our treatment, that would be a cohort of 3,000 people. Um, and I'm not the CFO, but you can do quick math with 3,000 people paying $260,000 a procedure. And since you brought it up about the affording part of this, what's the consensus on part of this being supported by reimbursement, or is that just not an option? So, so I think we will get there, um, but we didn't want to model that since we have no codes now for reimbursement. So we, we do believe that um, this is something that, you know, will ultimately be reimbursed, um, but we don't have provision for that today. And I know you covered it, and I'm going to get the words wrong, but um, uh, it's the right to what law? What's the law that's allowing you to? Yeah. Sure. sure. So that's the right to try law. Um, and that was passed in 2018. And it was, you know, one of those great bipartisan common sense laws saying that if you were at the end of your life and you had explored your other options and those other options didn't work, um, and you couldn't get yourself into a FDA trial, that as long as you have a completed FDA phase one trial, which would certainly show safety, if not necessarily efficacy, um, that you could then avail yourself of that treatment if you chose to do so. Um, you know, and there's, there's significant provisions of that law. It, it alleviates the institution performing that procedure of liability. It alleviates the company performing that procedure of liability. There's extensive consents, um, but it, it basically allows somebody with no other alternative the right to pick their treatment, the right to try a treatment that doesn't have FDA approval at this time, but has passed an FDA phase one trial to show that it's not um, something that could potentially uh, harm the patients. It, you know, the, the balance is causing more, causing more good than harm. Gotcha. Makes sense. So can, can you talk a little bit about what you see in terms of uh, existing competitors, if any, or potentially being usurped by a... No, that, that's a great, it's a great question, you know, and, and you know, this is something that uh, Dr. Swischenberger and myself were speaking about just the other day. So if we limit ourselves to hospice and true end-stage patients, then these patients have um, already given up hope of living. So we don't compete then with the oncologists and other um, treatment options. If anything, we could be considered a benefit to them because we could now take a patient that was end stage going to die and you had the charts before, you know, within, you know, within a, a, a much shorter period of time, extending their life for over a year plus. If you extend their life by, you know, that amount of time, you give the oncologist additional ability to treat that patient, see that patient, bill for that patient, give different therapies the ability to continue to treat that patient, be it chemo or any other alternative immunotherapies, um, allowing them to continue to both treat and bill for those treatments. So we view ourselves as non-competitive. We view ourselves as putting a patient class that was literally on the door of death back into the population to be retreated because we are not a cure and we do not claim to be a cure. What we can do is significantly reduce cancer in the body and significantly extend life and quality of life. We cannot um, cure cancer so that we then place these patients back into the general population to be treated by their um, respective physicians and to go back on the regimes that they were formerly on. And if anything, as was indicated, we have an indication, although it will require further study, that our treatment may in fact help these other treatments 
be more effective. So that was a, a very good answer. And ju me judging it that a good answer is just logic. It's not technical knowledge, but uh, not but. In addition to, it would be super cool, I think, for the community to hear from a practicing a clinician, a doctor, about the fact pattern that would cause you to want to do this. It seems pretty clear to me, but I mean, for the record, does the doctor on the so let, let me kick let me kick this off. Let me kick this off to to to. We have actually two physicians, and we could take them one at a time. Um, but I, I just want to point out, you know, another thing is, you know, with respect to competition, we've completed two FDA phase one trials. So even if you were going to start down this road from step one, you'd have to first start doing F FDA trials. Um, but, you know, I certainly think that uh, Dr. Uh, Swischenberger would be happy to address that question, and you can follow with Dr. Winnitz. I think everyone listening to this podcast has loved ones that they've seen at the end of life who've had chemotherapy until the toxicity uh, made their organs either fail or their life miserable. And I think the most important aspect of this treatment is that it is a physiologic or environmental hit on the cancer that it's not equipped to tolerate. The adaptive mechanisms of cells and humans have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to tolerate variations in temperatures, including fevers. Whereas cancer cells have lost a lot of adaptive uh, pathways and a lot of adaptive mechanisms because they're growing uncontrollably. So if you can hit them with an environmental stress, they just can't tolerate it and they either die or they become stunted in their growth. And we take advantage of that. And the toxicities from this treatment seem to be very minimal. We have not seen lasting effects of this heat other than on the cancer. Once you get the treatment, it's over. And then you have that euphoria period you heard about. And then they do really well until the cancer finally figures it out and starts to come back months or years later. Jan? Yeah. <clears throat> You've uh, hit on all of the, uh, the points. The, the most startling of which is the um, lack of lasting side effects. And what is remarkable is that you see these patients go through the procedure with complete stability. And as you had uh, said, they wakened euphoric. And then many of them have recovered enough to be discharged the next day. Now with chemotherapy, um, most of the patients is just the opposite. They have these horrific side effects which decrease what, re what remaining quality of life they may have. And as I had said previously, our technique not just increases the quantity, but the quality and the dramatic difference that you see between our treatment and the conventional current treatments is just remarkable and dramatic. Th thank you, Jan. And if I could put it into, into a, a lay person's terms, and the doctors can certainly correct me, um, I've always thought of it as, you know, both from a quantity of cancer in your body and quality of life standpoint, kind of going from an end stage, uh, stage four terminal cancer back to a stage one-ish cancer from both the, the, uh, the amount of cancer in your body and your, your quality of life. So we have a question from uh, dearest Chloe. And you answered it, but let's just uh, allow her to, to uh, I'll repeat it here. I'm She's sorry. asking what the primary objective in terms of FDA endpoint, is it extending life or reducing the spreading of the cancer? So it, it, it does both. Um, it, it's kind of not reducing the spreading of the cancer because the cancer has already spread to the point where the person is terminal, but it reverses that spread of cancer. It, 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 as you saw from the slides that Dr. Winnett showed, you had two primary sites, you had metastatic sites, and those were greatly reduced, if not eliminated, um, after the treatment. But it doesn't eliminate all the cancer from your body. So 
it, it, it you know the the cancer will still has the ability to come back, but it certainly both extends life and reduces the amount of cancer in your body. So I just was following. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who else? Who else? This is Roger. Um, one of the remarkable things that we found in some of our, our basic science work is that when we heat the patients, we actually take the blood temperature to 47 degrees centigrade, and it takes just a very short amount of time for that to kill any metastasizing cells. These metastasizing cells are present in the blood um, and are just destroyed almost immediately. So uh, we really reduce the, uh, the spread of uh, the potential for the spread of cancer to other sites. We set that back quite a while, uh, quite a ways in time. Um, so I just wanted to address that. Thank you. Yeah, if I can also add, um, this approach is almost a specialization of what the body would normally do to a foreign invasion. And one of the first things it does is raise the temperature. But the body is only able to safely raise the temperature to a certain degree before deleterious effects occur. With our device and technique, we compensate for those deleterious effects that can have a negative impact on the patient, and they tolerate this procedure beautifully with the expected results of killing the invading agent, which would originally and initially raise a person's temperature. So I have a, one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, and I'm going to just quickly shout out here before Jeff Michelle leaves, because he was dialing it on the phone. He might be here, because this is all his fault. He's the one that introduced me to Ed and introduced me to the company. And so I just wanted to go on the record to thank everybody for that before we sign off. But I know this is probably a good answer why there's a no to this. but if you do the treatment, you have euphoric, you go spend some quality time, why wouldn't you do it again? So again, you know, we, we've just done initial, you know, we, we just completed our FDA phase one study and, you know, we, we needed endpoints um, and we needed to follow the protocol that we were, uh, you know, that was approved by the FDA. So there wasn't provision to keep retreating the patients. Um, and that is not uncommon in FDA studies. But now we have the right to try. And the right to try eliminates the input from the FDA and the restrictions. And we will be able to treat patients in the manner that we feel would be in their best interests. Correct. And our, our physicians feel that if, uh, you know, if we continue to treat patients, we, we could theoretically continue to get the same results, but we have no, you know, we have not done that, so we don't have the data to prove that. But from a theoretical standpoint, you're correct. And from a theoretical standpoint, just retreat them and repeat. Um, but we haven't done that yet. Very cool. So, um, I think we're about exhausted the questions here. I'm, I'm out for now. Um, but it's super interesting, and it's been really uh, thought-provoking to not only hear this, but to, to add up the numbers. I'm clearly, um, as an investor, I'm interested in something that can scale, and clearly you're proposing to go uh, to, to potentially go public here. So um, I really appreciate all this, and of course, the uh, community dialing in and spending their afternoon with us. Super grateful. We're going to send everybody a, a note uh, and uh, the company will send you information as well. And um, again, you guys have been super supportive of Family Office Insights as a community. And I, as always, I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to having cocktails in the afternoon, not just sandwiches when we get together next. I have no idea when that's going to be. We do have a question here. Hold on. Let's see. Nope. Arthur, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is Eddie Gibstein from COVID Capital Partners. Um, I want to thank everybody um, for, for attending uh, this webinar. And, of course, uh, 
I'd like to congratulate the team at Verthermia for accomplishing what they have so far and, of course, for uh, intending to continue uh, down the path of treating uh, these very, very sick people. Um, I want to expound on just something that, that Mitchell had said. First of all, COVA has been involved with Verthermia since 2015, so we're intimately aware of uh, the technology, the advancement of the technology, and how Verthermia has added and built this team. But um, one of the questions that was asked, I think, was about competition. And I just want to expand uh, or expound upon what Mitchell had said, because it's very important. Um, in order to, for another company, for instance, because very often, you know, the, uh, the conjecture is that a small company like, like Verthermia can easily be uh, copycatted or, or kind of squashed by some of the larger pharma companies. And in this case, because the right to try uh, requires that a company has completed an FDA human trial. Um, in this particular space, Verthermia probably has no less than four-year head start on anybody being able to compete because um, for another company to, number one, put together the protocols, apply to the FDA, get a patient population, begin treating that population, and then get the results, which include treating the patient until the last patient dies, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, is probably no less than a four-year process. And of course, um, Verthermia has done that both with um, small cell lung as well as ovarian. So I think that's really important to take notice of that, um, which, you know, on a different conversation may lead to partnerships and other, other types of uh, transactions with larger pharma. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear because I think it's really important that it's noted that Verthermia has a very, very large footprint in this particular space and one that probably can't be challenged without some other joint venture or otherwise by another pharma company for at least four years. And that's very important. Um, so thank you. And um, I, I appreciate you uh, letting me chime in here. You know, and, and that's accurate, Eddie. Anyone, anyone attempting to do this would have to first do a FDA, first start to submit for approval to do an FDA phase one trial and then get approval and then do it. So yeah, you're talking a, a very extended period of time. Super. Um, anybody have a closing statement? Mitch, you wanna wrap things up? I'll just bow out now and just say thank you to everybody once again. Yeah, sure, no, I just wanna really thank everyone for their time and consideration. You know, we're, 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 we're excited and you know, we believe we have a, you know, Know, a, a, an innovative, disruptive technology, and we, we look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, Arthur. You're welcome.